All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I know there'll probably be more joining after we uh, get underway here, but I'm really pleased to have um, Rob Black here today for our Rainforest Forum. Um, the purpose of the forum is to connect the university and the community and um, opportunities may emerge to work together as a result. So I want to acknowledge uh, Bob Nath and Cindy McGill. They are the board members of UNM Rainforest Innovations that oversee this event. And I believe um, they are on the call. So thank you both. So um, the New Mexico Chamber has been an important partner with UNM. Um, in particular, the summit that was held in January was a partnership uh, in large part with the New Mexico Chamber. And thanks to Rob Black for uh, working together on that summit. Um, the purpose was to really uh, engage with our community in terms of the outcome of a report that was commissioned by the New Mexico Chamber. And Rob will talk about that and, and what, what that has led to. So we are really pleased to have Rob with us today to explain that he's uh, a native New Mexican and is an expert in um, various leadership, public policy, advocacy, economic development in his role as president and CEO of the New Mexico Chamber. He's had a, a a wonderful career in uh, community relations. He worked in California for a number of years before returning to New Mexico. He has his uh, bachelor's degree in political science from UNM, and he has his JD from uh, the University of California, the Hastings College of Law. So thank you, Rob, for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, Lisa, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, address the group today and the opportunity to partner, uh, to partner with you and the Rainforest and, and UNM uh, over the last several several years, but in particular the last several months that we've been able to really uh, work together. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and if not, please just shake a finger at me. Um, but um, what, what I'll talk to you a little bit about is uh, the chamber. Um, and, and Lisa asked me to, you know, to really talk about some of the efforts we've been doing around our competitiveness analysis and strategy work, and, as well as a little bit about the session and, that we just went through and kind of what that means for, for us in the business community and where we see things going. Um, so I'll start off, you know, with the chamber, uh, New, the New Mexico chamber might sound odd to many on the call, uh, because we used, we've only been known as that since December. Um, but for the last 62 years, we've been known as the Association of Commerce and Industry. And uh, we, we did a brand re reset last year. Um, so just to, to kind of let you know, you know we are the, the same organization. Uh, little different colors and, and, and a little different name, uh, but our focus is really about you know being the voice for business in New Mexico, and and doing so in a way that is helping drive economic development uh, and making New Mexico a better place to live and work. So with that, um, as uh, last year the uh, chamber board asked us to um, engage in a economic development analysis for the state. Um, and it was really focused around uh, a competitive analysis about why it is that New Mexico hasn't done as well as we think we should, um, and how can we do better going forward in a post-pandemic world. The report was released in December, December as Lisa mentioned. Uh, we had a follow-up um, forum, a full-day forum with, in partnership with UNM uh, in January. Uh, the report's called Driving New Mexico's Future empowering a competitive economy in a post-pandemic world. Um, and, and really what we saw is that, you know, COVID-19 really exposed many strategic economic vulnerabilities for our country and for New Mexico. Um, and, and we wanted to make sure that we were doing a business-driven approach 
So how can we be more, uh, how can we come out of this more diverse economically and more resilient um, going forward? Um, but before I get too far ahead, I, I'll talk a little bit, you know, as, as I mentioned around the, what happened to, at the legislative session that we just went through. And, uh, you know, it was a really challenging session. So for any of you who were participating, trying to testify, trying to follow, uh, had bills of interest going before the board, or, or sorry, before the legislature, you know um, how challenging it was and how frustrating it was. Um, we were locked out of the building. Um, and if an, a legislator did not want to engage with, uh, with you, they just didn't have to pick up the phone or answer their text. So it made it for, because you couldn't hang out in the lobby. Uh, you couldn't hang out at the bar where you would, you know, at the bull ring, uh, where you knew they were going to show up. Uh, so it, it really did change the dynamic of how we tried to engage with the legislature. And, and the, the committee process was extremely challenging for those that tried it. it you know, in, in the Senate, um, often, especially at the beginning of the session, you had to give 24 hours notice that you wanted to provide public, public comment. And that might be via email only, or you may be able to call in, or you may be able to do the Zoom. Um, and it varied by committee. And they may add a new bill within 24 hours. So you didn't even know you had to sign up. So it, it created a lot of challenges. The House was a little easier. Um, they made it where you could sign up for a webinar. Um, and but it's still you're you're typically limited to one minute of comment, which meant um, if you're doing something like tax reform, you're doing paid sick leave, uh, it is really hard to get anything substantive across in a minute. So that was that was some of the challenges that we we saw with this session, and you know to give a level set as to what we were going into as we went into the session. Um, the economy of New Mexico has been remarkably impacted by COVID. The chart I'm showing you today is, is something that it's, it's um, from tracktorecovery.org. It's published by Harvard University in partnership with uh, the Gates Foundation. And it uses real-time credit card swipes to provide uh, as close to real-time economic data as you can. And what you're seeing here is is that the uh, change in revenue, small business revenue from January, 2020 to uh, March 31st of this year. And you see, you know, small business overall has dropped almost 35% in revenue in that time. Leisure and hospitality really has taken a hard hit as you can see from here. Um, what is interesting, and, you know, I just noticed this as I was, preparing for this discussion today is that steep drop in the last three weeks. And I honestly don't know what's going on with that, um, but it's about a 4% drop uh, since the last time I gave this presentation at the Economic Forum. So it is a very, uh, something's going on right now uh, with, with regard to uh, small business revenue that, you know, maybe as we get through this, there may be some folks who have some insight there. Um, but the other part to that is you look at this, the number of small businesses open and we have, this was as of March 12th, almost 36% less small businesses doing card swipes in New Mexico as there were in January, 2020. What's even more disturbing is this one. And this is as of March 31st. Again, it was 36%. Now we're at 43% less. So something is happening within the small business world over the last month that has uh, been significantly impactful on their on the, both the businesses that are open and processing payments. That's I, I share that just to kind of provide the level set that we were going into this session with a very very challenging economic environment. And fortunately, there were some really important economic recovery bills that were presented and got through. And I'll highlight some of the key ones. SB1, which created a restaurant gross receipts tax deduction, 
Um, it, it will also, from March 1st to June 30th, it will also provide some $600 rebates for low-income uh, workers, SB2, which waives liquor license fees, SB3, which um, enhanced the small business loan program, which it was which was initially created in June of 2020 special session. And then the HB 11 LIDA changes, which is really an innovative way to try to help support um, very impacted businesses. It creates a grant program, uh, a, a form of a grant program for $200 million in written lease and mortgage relief for businesses such as hospitality, those that are most impacted. And so these bills were, were good, helpful relief bills, but certainly aren't gonna offset the overall impact of, of COVID. Um, where we also saw some growth that were some positive pieces were a variety of other areas. Um, and I'll highlight a few of them. The manufacturing um, service services, gross receipts uh, bill, HB 278, it was brought forward by Representative Harper in Rio Rancho. He it, it eliminated the GRT on, um, on accounting services, so you don't have that pyramiding, but it also created a, an exemption for manufacturing equipment for GRT. So that should be very helpful for those businesses, smaller businesses who don't get an IRB um, industrial revenue bond but still have those manufacture, that manufacturing tax. So uh, that's a big one we had. So a variety of areas in broadband uh, that we think will be very helpful going forward for the economy. Um, the two biggest were probably the, uh, our, our, our SIN bills this year, I guess we could call them, um, your liquor license reform and your cannabis regulation act. Um, and these are really probably the most transformative bills of the session. Um, HB 255 will completely reform how restaurants uh, are licensed as it relates to liquor license or liquor, um, will greatly reduce the, the cost of entry into those, those hospitality sectors, um, will allow for delivery uh, from and around the state. So for those communities like Farmington, um, Silver City, that we're really having a difficult time affording a 500 to a million dollar liquor license to start a restaurant because they just don't have the volume. Uh, this will be a transformative uh, piece of legislation for, for those economies. It is gonna cause a lot of heartburn for the existing uh, license holders, but it will be transformative. Similarly, uh, the Cannabis Regulation Act um, you know, this is going to change. A, this is going to create a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs and for in spaces that people don't think a lot about. Um, testing area of opportunity for for entrepreneurs. Um, plant disposal. Who? Th I mean, yeah, they're going to have to get rid of a lot of product that is normally not legal to be in possession of. So there's needs to be people who get rid of it. Uh, not just, you know, once you've got processed the, the plant. So there's just a lot of different industries that are going to be surrounding uh, cannabis. Again, will be transformative for the state. But there were a lot of bills that were very negative. And, you know, the, the, the whole concept was we're going to have a regular, we're going to have a, a legislative session in the middle of a global pandemic. And we are doing it because we need to recover. Well, that didn't get across to a lot of folks. And there was a lot of things that were very ancillary to economic recovery that would put forward um, in the legislature. That's, again, I talked to you a little bit about how challenging it was to communicate to legislate to members of the legislature. It created a lot of heartburn in the business community uh, from us at the state chamber, to local chambers, to uh, individual uh, businesses. Um, so we actually, as, this, as the state chamber, launched a variety of efforts to communicate uh, indirectly and directly with our legislators and allow for our members to do so as well. We bought nine full page ads in the largest papers around the state, asking them to focus on economic recovery and rebuilding the economy. We tried to highlight bills that were we thought would be make us less competitive, not more. 
Um, we helped get published over a dozen letters to the editor around the state. So we were very active in, in this regard. And the good thing is, is we got rid of a lot of bad bills. Um, but you notice that that list that of, of the bad bills was much bigger than the list of the good bills. And that was part of the challenge. Um, we're the ones that, that did pass that we had challenges with. Um, obviously uh, things like uh, HB 75, which was the medical malpractice bill. Um, we opposed that bill throughout the session. It was gonna um, create some very challenging environments for our, our rural hospitals. Um, the good thing is at the end of the day, we ended up supporting the bill because it was a negotiated compromise between the trial lawyers, the hospitals, our healthcare providers. And that's what you wanna see in a legislative process. So that, that bill did pass, but it, and it was one of those where everybody had something to like and something to hate, but that's, that's, you know, that's the legislative process. Um, but there were several other bills, whether it's HB 76 around uh, the ability to deny permits um, or revoke permits, um, several of the several environmental bills that passed, that we are, are afraid will make it much more complicated and difficult uh, to deploy capital. Um, so where do we go from here as a state? Um, we, we think, you know, as you think about where, where we go, um, we have to think about where we're at. And today, uh, New Mexico is very challenged. Um, our children, New Mexico's children deserve, we think, the same opportunities as those in other states. Um, and, but the question is, are we providing an equality of opportunity for the kids of New Mexico um, as it relates to educational opportunities and career opportunities as those that live in Colorado, Arizona, or Texas? When you think about that, I, I would argue that we are certainly not doing that today. Um, today, New Mexico is ranked third in child poverty. We rank last as a place to raise a family and our fourth graders are last in reading comprehension in the country. Uh, organizations like Forbes and US News rank New Mexico as one of the worst places in the country to start and operate a business. Chill, you know, it, again, it gets back to what are we doing to create opportunities for our kids to be able to work and live, build a community in the, in the communities where they, where they live today, to build that family and to be able to support them. Um, and as we come out of the pandemic, we must come out of it with a laser focus on rebuilding our economy through a lens of creating communities of opportunity for our children and through improved educational opportunities, but also, again, focusing on career opportunities when we think about that equality of opportunity. Um, we have a once in a generation opportunity in, 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 in chance to build in this state an economy based uh, using our oil and gas surplus and our reserves there uh, to invest in that economic diversification. How do we do that? Um, it's really, we believe, got to be a focus on competitiveness. And this is what, this gets to kind of the core part of the report we created in December. And this list that you see on the left is really a, a, an area that a site selector is going to look at when they determine uh, if this is a good place, if New Mexico is good, a good place to deploy capital. And we think that it really breaks down into four key areas, workforce and education, innovation, and that's that innovation ecosystem, uh, which frankly, the rainforest is a key driver for us here in New Mexico. Um, the overall business climate and regulatory climate that includes taxes. And then what does our physical infrastructure look like? And are we uh, well prepared for investment? Um, you know, when we think about those key metrics that help drive some of those, some analysis, the, the determination of kind of where we sit vis-a-vis -vis other states, job growth, wage growth, and GDP growth are three of the really most important metrics. And when you look over the last 10 years, we've, we've been in a bad spot. Um, we were in the mid, mid, to, mid 40s uh, or 40 for GDP growth over the last 10 years up to 2019. But over the last five years, we saw 
some significant improvement, um, both in those areas, but especially in around GDP. Oh, I apologize, wrong, wrong direction. Um, and when we think about how we are ranked visa, uh, by organizations like Forbes, Chief Executive Magazine, et cetera, our overall average rankings put us, and this is a little complicated, but if you look at the horizontal axis, um, it puts us in the in the 40, in the mid 40s. And that's where we rank as far as how Forbes and others look at New Mexico as a place uh, for being business friendly. But if you look at the vertical axis, you see that we fall between 15 and 20. So what that says is we're actually outperforming on the key metrics of job growth, wage growth, and GDP growth than our rankings. So New Mexico is actually better positioned in, in, in kind of real time than how we're being viewed by ranking organizations that site selectors reference. And but part of the challenge we have is we're starting at a very low level. So this chart matches or correlates our, our overall GDP with our personal income. You wanna be up at the top right and we're down at the bottom left. So while we're seeing significant improvements, we have a long way to go to be able to kind of get, uh, get through, to, to show that larger improvement, to catch up with some of our sisters, our comparator states. When we think about competitiveness, we, we again, for our research, we contracted a guy by the name of Ted Abernathy who runs economic leadership out of North Carolina. And Ted does a annual report for his manufacturing clients to look at various factors that make a state competitive for manufacturing investment. A little bitty tight, so I apologize for that. The upside good news is if you look at uh, where we're strong, we're number three in the country for infrastructure. So we're well positioned with that. Where we're not good is 50th for workforce. So we have a long, again, this is why that workforce education priority is a key for New Mexico to become more competitive. And so we identified you know, some key challenges for us. And again, as we think about um, what we need to do to become more competitive, it's that improving our business climate, workforce skills, investing in that infrastructure. And th these two charts show the kind of percentage of job growth from 2009 to 19, and then the GDP growth. And again, we're seeing improvements uh, over those 10 years. We're, you know, 6% job growth, but our neighborhood is really strong and they're outperforming us uh, dramatically. Same thing on the GDP side. And the other challenge for us that's, that's daunting, frankly, is our working age population and what's happening to the state. The, the map on the left shows the last five years and where we've been declining in population and growing. And the red obviously is the decline. And this isn't new, this is, or this isn't unique for New Mexico. This rural urban divide is happening throughout the country, but it's really uh, exacerbated here. Uh, and then the chart in the upper right talks about looking forward and what it looks like for the next 10 years for New Mexico as it relates to um, our working age population. And we're projecting a loss of over 3% of that age group uh, as a percentage of population in New Mexico, while you see 3.5% growth in Texas and a 6.5% growth in Utah. This is not, again, a place that helps us be competitive for future investment. This uh, articulates really where we're going to see growth. And that's in the over 50 category. So um, as a sad participant in that group, I am sorry to see that I'm also adding to the, 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 the growth in the over 50 age, but it's a huge increase that we're projecting over the next 10 years. And again, loss of, of, of percentage under age 20 and very little growth uh, in that 20 to 50 area. Um, but what, what can we do? 
And as a state, we believe that we need to really be championing emerging technologies companies here in the state that, that align with our research strengths, build on our, our a talent attraction strategy that's really highlighting the, the beauty of New Mexico, um, the affordability, our outdoor recreation spaces, um, something that, you know, those ideas that apply and reinforce why a young professional might want to live here. And, you know, frankly, you, you throw in to that uh, what we just did with alcohol reform, recreational cannabis. Those are things that 20, 30 somethings might actually find attractive when they're looking at a place to relocate. So um, while that's not how we normally think about it, that may be areas where, again, we're looking for how we bring those young people to live here. We need to target uh, existing supply chains, um, take advantage of our proximity to Mexico. That is a really a, a, a resource that uh, Senate Teresa and the border crossing has grown significantly an impact for the state, but I think it's an area where we can continue to really emphasize. Um, strengthen our short term retraining and work experience uh, programs to in demand, in demand occupations, uh, certifications, upskilling, etc. Um, we need to really focus on underserved communities and that again, thinking about the equality of opportunity uh, in ways not just with vis-a-vis uh, -vis Arizona and New Mexico, but also uh, our traditionally underserved uh, minorities in the state, um, bringing those folks fully into the economy. And then we really have to focus on using data kind of to drive the conversation. Um, some of the recommendations we have regarding how do we be more, you know, more competitive, we must be really intentional about with and focus on addressing our skilled workforce shortage. Um, we have to be really, really focused on reforming our regulatory environment. Uh, leverage our geographic strengths as well as continue to build out our logistics and physical infrastructures. Nurture an innovation ecosystem here in the state and partnership with UNM, our, our other universities and our national labs. Uh, and really make sure we're aligning those to business needs. Um, and, and what are we doing and how are we leveraging those opportunities in partnership with government to really grow the economy and raise prosperity for all of our citizens? Um, as the session showed us, um, we're not particularly working in a business-friendly environment here in New Mexico. Um, those states around us, like Arizona, Texas and Utah, they've prospered uh, and they have, but they have political leadership that is committed to economic development. And, but I wanna emphasize, this is not a red state or blue state conversation. Um, you can look at Colorado, for example, and their success. Under Governor Hickenlooper, the state contracted with the Brookings Institute to lay out an economic development blueprint for the state. And they got buy-in from government private sector, educational institutions, and then they executed. And they were disciplined and they stuck to the plan. And you, you can look to the impact financially or economically for the state as to the impact on that. Um, for this to work in New Mexico, we must think differently. We must act with a sense of urgency and we must focus on equality and always work towards consensus. And what that means to me is, you know, when we think, think about thinking differently, it's we have to look at who are non-traditional allies. Um, you know, the Chamber of Commerce needs to be working with labor. Uh, we need to be working with uh, our, better with our, our, our educational institutions. Um, we have to think about, you know, how do we invest in those communities to raise uh, our childhood, our educational outcomes? And you know, I talked about the idea of acting with urgency, and I, I talked about oil. You know, we have we're not close to peak oil supply, but we're certainly getting close to peak oil demand, and that's going to hit New Mexico over the next five, ten years. And regardless of of you know, that's going to cause prices to go down. It's going to mean the forty percent of revenue generated by oil and gas is going to be reduced, and. If we don't do something about that 
in the next five years, we will condemn the next generation of New Mexicans to poverty. And so that is for me why we must act with urgency in how we diversify our economy. And then a focus on equality. And again, as we think about as a business community, um, we have to have both, a, I think, a different mindset and a different language about how we talk about the importance of economic development. And it is about creating that equality of opportunity for our kids educationally, career-wise, whether they're in Albuquerque or in Grants or in Socorro, or, um, and also as it relates to those, those populations which have been formerly disenfranchised in the state, both econom economically and otherwise, our Native American populations, um, our Hispanic populations. And then you think about also how that translates more broadly and how our kids compete with, other, with the states around us. Uh, and do they have those same opportunities? So I think that's the focus that we as the, as the business community really have to be thinking about. Um, the good news is, while there's a lot of work to be done, um, we're heading in the right direction. So this is from today, a press release from today. Uh, the Economic Development Department announced the launch of their state of the state's new strategic planning process. They've contact, contracted with SRI International, which Lisa, I know you know, um, formerly uh, the Stanford Research Institute. And they're gonna hold their first stakeholder meeting next Monday to start the process. Their goal is to have a report completed by mid-September and published. So it's gonna be a pretty quick process. Um, we're, we're pleased that they're incorporating the research we've already done into the overall uh, report that they're building. Um, and you know, we believe still that the, our analysis, which is really based around policy choices to become competitive, will be hopefully empowering to what they come out on the strategic analysis side. So they're not gonna recommend a, a governor's office of regulatory reform in their report while we did ours. So you know, we'll be working on the policy side to create a much more uh, competitive environment across the state. Um, but we think this is, gonna, this is a key step for the state going forward. And it's gonna be incumbent upon all of us to engage heavily in the, in the process over the summer so that we can help shape that uh, so that truly is a consensus document working with all aspects of, of the New Mexico's economy. Um, and so that's what you know, we'll be focused on over the next several months um, is really partnering with the state on their strategic planning efforts uh, and, and advancing key competitiveness issues, policy is initiatives in the areas workforce development, infrastructure investment, regulatory reform, and support for our innovation ecosystems in the state. Um, and with that, uh, Lisa, I'll stop and, and be happy to answer questions or uh, whatever you would prefer. Thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you for talking about the state's uh, strategic planning that they're doing too, because as we have talked about, we wanna continue this partnership and dialogue. So UNM is planning to do another summit around the state EDD strategies so that uh, will allow us to kind of continue that discussion as, as a big group. We do have a couple of questions and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, one of the questions is, can you explain why right to work is right for our state? Uh, no, I can't explain why right to work is right for our state. Um, the, the reason I can't uh, is that uh, the political environment today is one that um, right to work is not really a reality uh, that is going to happen. I mean, in the last legislative or the 2019 legislative session, uh, there was preemption created statewide, eliminating the county based efforts for right to work. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's it is certainly something that's on the site selector list, which uh, you may have seen, but um, we also have to pick fights that we think are winnable and that are um, 
that are going to be show that kind of return on investment for the time and energy invested. And right to work, I don't believe today in New Mexico is a fight that the business community could win if we wanted to. And so then it's, uh, are we making friends or making enemies? And I think we need to be working to try to collaborate more, not fight more. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, and please feel free to put questions in the chat, or when we run out of those, I'll open it up for live questions as well. Uh, what is the role of crime in deterring business investment? That is a great question. And it is, I think, frankly, it's pretty significant, unfortunately. And I, I have another chart that we had that um, correlated poverty and crime rates. Um, and unfortunately, that chart, New Mexico is a very big outlier in. Um, and so what we do here, and this is more anecdotal, um, and I think it's something that, uh, you know, going forward, we're hoping to, we're we're working to partner very closely with, you know, again, we want to partner more closely with UNM, but also with AED and, and they're doing research uh, and they're talking to businesses who are considering locating in New Mexico and or the New Mexico partnership. And what we hear from those anecdotal conversations is educational outcomes, huge impact on whether or not uh, a CEO wants to move his company here and bring his family what that's going to look like and his employees and crime rates. You know, when, when um, a doctor is coming to visit Presbyterian thinking about moving to New Mexico, one of the things they, you know, they look at is the schools and the crime rate. And that is a big determinant of whether or not somebody moves in those skilled and those skilled workforce areas. Cause they're, you know, uh, if you're, if you're a, an engineer, you're a, software engineer, technology, medical provider, you can have a little bit of choice and you wanna make sure that you're doing what's best for your family and crime plays into that, definitely. Hey Rod, this is Scott. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we didn't get Space Command, right? It's, uh, that, that was devastating actually, but Air Force pointed to what this issue right here, crime and education for families. Scott, you're right, and and um, and that was what um, uh, the the base command were commander was was talking about. They, you know, those are metrics, and that gets back to the data driven component of where we as a state have to get to. We need to be able to think about what's the data that site selectors, whether it's the government site selector or uh, a, a corporate Fortune 500 site selector, what's the data they're using, and how do we adjust that data in New Mexico? How do we start to move the needle around things that are important for site selection? That's how we're gonna become more competitive. And unless we do that, um, we, will be a, we will continue to be a fly over state, not a fly to state. Let, let me ask one question, one more question to that. That data that you're gathering that will trend over time will create such a powerful argument, uh, a powerful thesis um, for a pro-business environment. What do we got to do to get these legislators that don't get it to be more pro-business friendly? Because this this is the issue. I mean, we're like cutting our own throats half the time. One of the issues. Well, Scott, I think I think that's uh, part of it is is having the data. Uh, so you know, we do have to create. And, and again, I was just actually on a on a call with AED uh, right before this call, a couple hours before where they've now set up a whole new economic impact analysis tool that they're going to be using and businesses can contract with them to build out um, that's going to have be able to build in multipliers. And so I think that data is something we're working to be able to get a much better picture of. Um, and then we're going to continue to work as, as the, the state chamber in looking at competitiveness, competitiveness analysis with other jurisdictions so that Again, we're able to reinforce the need to and areas of needed improvement. But to the point of those who don't um, already under, un, appreciate the urgency, I think, again, that's where we as the business community has to think about how we talk about these issues. And again, you know, whether it's giving up sacred cows, like having, you know, continuing to raise right to work, um, we can have that, we can continue to try to raise that conversation and lose, 
and lose the ability to build partnerships with labor. I believe that we need to be able to be in a position where we focus on the 90% of things we agree on. If you're in the construction trades, you want construction, development, work. So that's where we need to build those non-traditional allies. It's a different way of approaching it, but I think um, given the pandemic, given the urgency that I, you know, I, the numbers that I was talking about that's happened to our small businesses in this state, we have to think differently about how we move the needle, how we make investments. And we have to be able to talk with democratic legislators in a language that they understand and can appreciate. And that's why I think it's important to think about the equality of opportunity and what we're creating for our kids here in New Mexico. And are we creating that same opportunity here in New Mexico as they are in Arizona, Utah, and Colorado? Yeah, that's fantastic, Rob. I'll applaud There's... you and the chamber for everything you're doing. Great, great, great work. A real Thank champion you. for the state. Thank you. There's a couple more questions. Let's try to get to those. Um, can you share your thoughts on immediate recovery needs versus drivers of long-term resilience uh, and or growth? That's a great question. Um, yes. So I earlier I had a slide of, of recovery uh, ideas. And those are things like, uh, you know, the short, there's a short-term loan program that, uh, the, the, that we're using the severance tax permanent fund to provide loans to impacted businesses at half prime rate. That's a great you know, uh, recovery tool. The, some of the tax relief efforts, the, the regulatory relief efforts around licensing, you know, those are again, recovery-based efforts. Um, a longer term one, which we worked very hard in, and I, I should have focused a little bit more on it during uh, my, my presentation, was the special session SB2. So this is a leader reform bill and we had worked on, it was initially in part of House Bill 11 and then it got split out and it was a variety of different iterations within the, the, the regular session. But the long and the short of it is it did not pass the regular session. It is a bill that would basically have the GRT uh, cost to a, for construction for a development project of $350 million or more. So we're talking very large construction and it would, um, that's the kind of long and short of it. We know that there are three companies that are already in talks with the state uh, around this issue um, and it didn't pass the legislature. So we worked very hard to get that put on the governor's call as part of a special session that they were gonna have on cannabis. We were successful in getting that in. So that's a, a bill that I think for the long-term economic growth is, you know, again, we're talking 300 you know, projects of 350 million or more in construction. This will put us in a much better competitive place to get those sort of bills. Other areas where we think, you know, longer term, um, again, how are, very long term, early childhood education it is a priority for the chamber, um, ensuring that we're that that's well funded, but also key to that not only funded, but accountable. There has to be data metrics tracking across departments, how we're what the successes are, where we're losing people in the system. Do do investments in early childhood workforce actually create better outcomes for those children. We need to be tracking outcomes, not just inputs. So that's, you know, those are types of things that we as a state need to get better at. And that's some of those long-term economic development efforts, I think that we, we can be focused on. Thank you. Um, another question is about infrastructure. How do we uh, connect directly into the Biden administration's infrastructure planning and import for New Mexico? We need to go directly to them, even though we rank high in infrastructure, we should be number one. Well, I mean, the that ranking of infrastructure uh, is a little deceiving because there's a lot of areas where, where within our infrastructure, we need help, right? I mean, whether it's broadband, uh, whether it's some of our roads, um, 
but as it relates to you know rail, we have a pretty strong rail system, but we need additional spurs. There are those sorts of things that I think could really help on an infrastructure side. But as it relates to the uh, the Biden plan, we are uh, very active as the, uh, the 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 state chamber in what's called a council of state chambers. So that's my forty five counterparts or CEOs of their state chambers. We meet once a week with the U.S. Chamber uh, and to talk about issues that are of, of import. So this, the the we've launched a, a partnership with the U.S. Chamber. It's called um, Build by the Fourth of July. So that idea is to get an infrastructure bill passed by the fourth. Um, we are in conversations and and have, um, with uh, some of our federal delegation around how do we align our workforce strategies, those investments that could be coming our way around uh, whether it's water infrastructure, so we have more water resilience for, our, for growth, et cetera, uh, as part of that bill. So I think we need to be engaging directly with our, our legislators because one of the things that you, you may have also noticed is that Congress put pork barrel back in the barrel. So um, we, there was, for many years, they were prohibiting um, being able to kind of do your, your, your one-off pro programs. That's back on the table now. So we as, as the community, the business community and New Mexicans need to be advocating for those projects in our community. Otherwise, it's just the federal paid lobbyists who are gonna be advocating for those things. So I think there's a, there is a new kind of window of opportunity for us to really be proactive with our federal delegation um, and, and our, you know, frankly, our, we have a, a cabinet member now from New Mexico. Um, you know, those are contacts where we need to be leveraging that for that federal investment. Okay. So Lisa, I'll just make a quick comment. And Rob, thank you on that. That was my question. Uh, and you've got a very well uh, incentivized and motivated group of business individuals, educators, uh, not for profits that want to see that happen. So anything we can do to get directly involved in that in terms of projects, uh, recommendations, engagement, let us know. Uh, this is something very critical, I think, for New Mexico. And infrastructure is very encompassing. Uh, you tag energy to that. You talked about water. These are key fundamental aspects that New Mexico needs in order to get not only stay where we are, which is not a place we want to stay, but to move forward. So please reach out uh, whenever you can. Well, th that's great. Um, and um, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind sharing my contact information with the list, I I'd appreciate it so that folks can reach out to me because there, you know, we need to be identifying those projects and, and, and moving those kind of up the list. You know, it, whether it's Paso del Valcón, you've got um, Mesa del Sol's off-ramp, you know, uh, for the interstate. There's a variety of, of those sorts of things we need to be thinking about. I, I feel very strongly about our water infrastructure. And, you know, water is going to be a key piece as we think about climate change and the risks of climate change. Our resiliency as it relates to climate resilience is important. Um, making those investments. Albuquerque has done a great job in that. I mean, we're truly leaders in the country around what we've been able to do as far as replenishing the aquifer. But the rest of the state, we need to be really thinking, leaning forward as to what that infrastructure for the next 20, 30 years looks like. Okay. Um, another question of the key areas you listed, which one could we move in one year? Oh, key areas. And, and, and I guess my question would just to clarify, what do you mean by key areas? Are those kind of those four buckets or um, box? Yes, uh, the, four, the four buckets you were talking about, workforce um, and the other three that are coming to my mind right now. Sure. So I actually think you know, my my hope is we move it's, it's going to we're going to move the needle on all four. Um, so we're going to spend the next several months working to build out um, pieces of legislation that can address those, those, those areas. And we already have um, a list of kind of 17 top priorities or, 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 or 
priorities isn't the right word, um, best practices from other states in, in bucketed in those sections. And then we've got another 20 or 30 ideas that we wanna be working with our legislators, uh, whether it's again on relocation. Uh, so example, uh, Oklahoma has an aerospace relocation effort around engineers where they provide a tax credit to both the individual engineer and the employer if an aerospace engineer relocates to Oklahoma because they wanted to really build out that industry. Over the last, I think it was five years, they've had over 4,000 engineers move into the state. So, you know, that really had an, is because they're trying to build that industry. So those sort of targeted pieces aligning with the state's economic strategy, I think we can move along all of those fronts. Um, it's, but it's for, up for us to really try to think about how we prioritize that in partnership with the administration and legislative leaders uh, and packaging it. You know, in terms of that, um, not many people realize it, but New Mexico is one of the top leaders in photonics. Uh, and we could uh, escalate that and captivate it before Oklahoma starts paying people or Arizona or Colorado. I mean, that's if we put just a small amount, relatively small amount of money into it, I think would make a huge difference quickly. Well, Bob, thank you for that. And again, um, I encourage uh, I encourage anyone on the on the on the call today reach out to me. I, I we want to hear that sort of feedback where you see opportunities uh, for uh, a focus. You know, some of though what we're going to be looking at is is really systemic strategic reform. You know, uh, regu our regulatory environment is really really difficult to deploy capital in, and and again this legislative session made it worse. Um, what we need to be doing is looking at how do we how do we do regulatory reform at a systemic level, and there are models in Arizona, in Virginia, which happened within a bipartisan legislative structure under Democratic governor, where there are very good best practices of reviewing department by department regulations, aligning them with federal, state, local, and streamlining. And again, it's not about getting rid of environmental regulations. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about making them better and work more efficiently. And so we would like to see the governor create a, the governor's office of regulatory reform, require a review of each department's regulations every five years with recommendations to how do we streamline and reduce those regulations. And I think steps like that on a strategic level can help move us forward. So. All of those sorts of things we think we can really move the needle on this year. But again, um, we have to create that sense of urgency with our legislators that now's the time to make these changes in these investments. Because if we don't do it now, we're going to miss the window of time to leverage our oil and gas revenues for those investments. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> we have um, another comment and question. Um, Early childhood was mentioned, but we have had all day kindergarten for almost two decades. So what positive impact has that had on business in New Mexico? It was thought that all day kindergarten would benefit uh, New Mexico, has it? If it hasn't, how will pre-K benefit our state? Just to point out that Texas, Utah, Arizona, and Oklahoma are right to work states and seem to be more business friendly. Uh, yes, uh, to the last point, yes, definitely seem to be more, more business friendly. Um, the, as it relates to the kindergarten, also right, we don't have good data. And that's part of the problem. We are terrible in New Mexico at tracking outcomes, aligning policies with um, our investments, and then understanding whether or not those investments are actually paying off. And so I think we have to, you know, we did support the creation of the, the merged early childhood department, but as part of that support, it was conditioned on the, the requirements that we start to track with better data, better reporting, um, where those investments go and what are the outcomes for uh, student achievement. And I think that's what we as a state 
have and, and, and the business community have to demand of the state. You know, they're going to be coming to us in the next election asking for more money from the permanent fund to support education and early childhood. And that money has to be, we have to hold them accountable if there's any hope for, you know, support of that effort. There has to be um, investments in uh, the technology required to get the data to understand what's working and what's not. Um, now, as to the science around early childhood, it's pretty strong that, you know, early investments in, even in prenatal uh, healthcare, and then, you know, uh, breaking cycles of poverty, breaking cycles of, of, of trauma are really important. We have a lot of that in New Mexico. Again, we're, we're one of the worst or, or highest in uh, childhood poverty in the country. You know, those are some of the things we have to also think about. How do we address that in order for children to have better educational outcomes? So again, it's, it, these are the long-term investments we have to make. But you don't put it, you don't create an investment without understanding what your potential ROI is and then measuring that. Because um, if you're not measuring, you, you, you're, you, you don't know. So I think those are things we have to really push. Hey, Lisa, can I throw in a, just a quick comment? Um, of course. As a new member of the State Workforce Board, I was intrigued to see the effort that's been underway. Um, and I don't think Dale's on. I don't know if anybody else is there, but the the effort Rob has been on to centralize, to coordinate this whole data capture effort and uh, how that's taken over a decade and a lot of good work from a lot of people just to get it to the point where we've been able to create these unique identifiers, bring data together, be able to operate on data. So to your point about having the data, what is the uh, state chamber doing uh, in coordinating with the state workforce board to help accelerate that? So we have, um, it's, I will say I've been, we've worked a lot with Secretary McCamley on these issues. And um, he's been a very uh, robust partner with us around um, kind of our, you know, working on, on these, some of the workforce components. With that said, um, we haven't focused on the data collection as it relates to workforce training as much. Um, I was on a, you know, I was on a call this morning with um, a, a potential member who specializes in that set of data, that sort of data collection and technology analysis, kind of, um, and and does work with workforce solutions. And so I, I think there are, we have some of those resources here in state. I don't know that we're utilizing them effectively. So um, I think that is again where we want to put our emphasis is uh, utilizing uh, the information that's there, putting it in a place where we can make informed decisions with it. Um, you know, we, I was on a, a call, uh, I guess it was an economic leadership or economic forum call um, about three weeks ago and Roel Torres was on the call. You know, the, the district attorney talking about the, the new program he's instituting around data and around using data to really um, disrupt uh, criminal activity. And you know, other places are able to do that effectively. We have not been able to, but we're investing in that technology to be able to better utilize it. I think it's the same thing as it relates to, to workforce. Um, how are we tracking folks, whether it's from you know, early you know, high school outcomes through the workforce systems into placements, we're, we're not. So is there a way for us to better um, case manage folks using that data so that we can understand what those outcomes are and where people are, are, are falling out? And there we can target resources as opposed to kind of just throwing money at it. Okay, thank you. I think we are out of time now. I know there've been some requests for a copy of your slides, Rob, if you're willing to let us send those out to the Absolutely. attendees, that would be copy. great. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all and a great discussion, a lot of good questions and interaction and uh, we'll look forward to our next session. Thank you. Thank you.